Mr. Chair, Chair you are now live. I am live. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the August 17th, 2021 uh, monthly meeting of the Maritime Advisory Board of the City of Annapolis. Uh, with us this evening are board members Frida Wildy, Debbie Goslin, Duncan Hood, Mike Tomasini, Peter Trogdon, and Bill Woodward. Um, we also have staff members Stephen Rice, um, Eric Lashinsky, Sally Nash, and our recorder Tammy Hook. And Julian Jacques is our um, uh, coordinator of the uh, C-A-T, C-O-T, whatever we are, C-A-T-V. Um, we also have with us this evening Eileen Fogarty from the Department of, uh, consultant to the Department of Planning and Zoning. And she and Eric Lashinsky and um, uh, Stephen Rice are going to give us an update on the Maritime Task Force report. Um, and I'm gonna, I told them I would take them first so that we could, then we'll get onto our regular agenda. Uh, just by way of background, I to remind everybody, I set everybody out a note. There, there are basically two parts to uh, the Maritime Task Force uh, uh, endeavor that, uh, that we'll be reviewing. The first is this evening, which is that uh, Eileen and her group is going to give us an update or actually a summary of what the task force did, how it came to its recommendations, basically the strategy and mechanism of how the task force completed its work and uh, provided its report. Um, then uh, in September, and the date is to be, as I indicated, maybe a little bit uh, up in the air, uh, following the planning commission and then following the, perhaps the rules committee, we will take up the substance of the zoning portion of the, of the legislation. And I, and I emphasize the fact that there is a, a zoning portion because there are three components, as Eileen will point out, uh, that I want to remind everyone. There's three components to the task force report. One is the maritime zoning amendments. The second is the uh, a component for what generally referred to as water access. And the third component is for uh, a component for su uh, support of the maritime um, uh, employment, basically, and Eileen can elaborate on that. But I just want everybody to be aware that they, we're, there are three different components and not to lump them uh, all as, as an all in one uh, uh, part of the, uh, of the task force. There were three separate tasks that were part of that task force. So uh, with that, I will uh, introduce Eileen, who I thought was here. Ah, there she is. Um, Eileen, um, it is your presentation. Thank you so much. I'm looking to make sure, oh, I see Rod is on because he um, will be speaking with you um, right after, after I do. Um, start your video. Okay, I got all these buttons coming up. Um, as Terry said, uh, Rod Jabin, Eric Lashinsky, Stephen Rice, and I will be um, presenting to you this evening. Um, next slide, please. And we're going to talk to you about the Maritime Task Force strategy. You have three people on your board, Terry, Debbie, and Mike, who have actively participated in it. And hopefully all of us have captured uh, your interest and your commitment to the maritime. Um, the strategy establishes the framework for everything that is gonna go forward. And as Terry just pointed out, there are really three ways to implement it. One is the zoning ordinance, which uh, will be coming to you shortly. It is put together by the council. Right now we have eight council members and the mayor endorsing it. Uh, one is the Annapolis Maritime Industry Programs and Funds, which is uh, a fund and programs to directly benefit the industry. And the third is the Water Access Plan, which gets underway in November. Um, so as you are all very well aware, because Terry reminded me that you uh, were brought together as a board shortly after the initial ordinance in 1987 was adopted with the initial districts. 
It's been 34 years. 34 years is a long time to not have any changes. Um, we also have the comprehensive plan going forward right now. So this um, maritime task force report strategy called strengthening the industry will become an element of the comp plan. And that is what we will be asking you tonight to endorse. Uh, the purpose of this effort was to create a consensus. Um, next slide, please. And to do that, we had just an incredible group of people. Many of these people, um, you know, as some of them are on your board. We had residents from Ward 1, Ward 7, Ward 8. We had owners from three of the districts because uh, WMM, ME, and MI, we were not dealing uh, with the uh, Maritime Conservation District at City Dock. We had a whole range of industry representatives from people involved in the services to working yards, uh, yacht designers. Um, we had public interest, the Park Service, Chesapeake Bay Trust, Spa Creek Conservancy, uh, the museum. And the whole effort was to reach a consensus um, where there are no actions that are being recommended that the majority of the task force did not endorse. And the reason it's so important to have a consensus is that every group of stakeholders has their own perspective. And without bringing people together, next slide please, where there is, there basically is, um, you know, a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of experience. No one stakeholder group got everything they wanted, but no stakeholder group was harmed in any way. And I think what was so impressive about this is that you had ultimately a few hundred years or probably several hundred years of experience in the industry. I bring that up because at various points, there were a couple of um, groups that were making the case that uh, this needed to be sent out to professional economic firms. It needed, we needed to spend months longer on it. And you're not gonna get better experience than the people we had on this team with knowledge uh, and experience. Next slide, please. Um, the, this chart actually stops when we went to city council in June, but during the process, you had two things. You had working teams. Everybody on the task force was in one of three working teams and the teams had, an, we tried to have an equal number of owners, industry people, residents, and then spread the public interest representatives throughout. Um, they, they met in their working teams. They brought forward recommendations to the entire task force. All of that was public. Ultimately, we had 25 uh, meetings and work sessions, but actually that number of 12 public work sessions has now moved to 15. So lots of opportunity for people to know what is going on. We now uh, have gone to the planning commission. We've had two meetings with them, one in July, one in August. They will be deliberating next Monday night. We will go to council in September. Next slide, please. The, as I said, the agreement really is that there is something to benefit everyone, but there is no actual um, harm and the attempt was to do no harm to any one group to re respect each other's perspectives. Next slide, please. The approach was the uh, task force decided early on to build on the success of the existing districts. And that foundation or keeping the four districts intact, focusing on the land intensive uses, the working yards, um, providing uh, triggers, an additional trigger in addition to the 25,000 square feet on land boat storage, the 30 ton lift uh, and boat clubs. We added to that list fuel docks 
So the emphasis was on maintaining a critical mass, a hub, if you will, um, for maritime services. There was a lot of discussion about uh, trying to open it up uh, to give some flexibility across the board, but there was um, strong pushback from both members of the industry and um, members from the residents, representatives from the residents, because the fear was that they, they wanted to see how opening it up some more worked. Was it necessary to open all of the districts completely? Next slide. And so what they, um, what they are bringing forward is a conservation strategy. Uh, there is flexibility uh, for reinvesting in the core maritime uses that anchor the districts. There's limited restaurants, um, restaurants in WMI. Um, we had uh, pushback from residents about expanding restaurants in WME. So primarily, uh, and that was because of the proximity of residents. Um, there is a dedicated maritime fund, which Stephen is heading up and is underway right now to attract, retain, and grow the industry. Uh, there is a commitment to invest in recruiting and training a workforce. Again, a commitment to a water access plan with incentives for providing water access. And the important thing to remember is that this is a plan about the maritime industry. There is a water access section, but the place to provide all the tools for water access is not in this document. It is in the water access plan. And there's an ongoing annual evaluation so that every year this gets relooked. And if there need to be adjustments, they can be made. Next slide, please. And I think the next slide is Rod Jabin. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, most of you know me and um, we're here um, trying to uh, represent the task force and, and a lot of you are, are well aware of what's going on. But um, so we, we, as Eileen said, I mean, we, we talked to a lot of people and we engaged a lot of different stakeholders. And this is by no means, um, you know, an effort to cure everything, but it's a small step in the right direction, we think that will put some changes into the zoning code and everything else that will provide a framework for us to move forward. And the most important thing I think to remember is that there's an annual review to make sure that that we're going in the right direction. Um, but to stick to the, the slides, um, it's, it's creating a vital future for the Annapolis maritime industry and its jobs, atmosphere, lifestyle, value, everything that we um, hold dear to our heart, our brand, our image here in Annapolis. Everybody knows, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir when I tell you there's 7,800 boats uh, in the zip codes um, and over 1,500 slips, um, two and a half million dollars in property tax revenue annually to the city's operating budget. So the marine industry, again, I'm preaching to the choir here with you guys. We feel like you're a friend of the task force and understand stuff. It has been a mission to educate not only the councilmen, but the planning commission and others on, on what this effort is all about, because it says maritime zoning or maritime task force and stuff to strengthen the industry. But the industry is very broad in Annapolis. You have the WMM, which is representing 70,000 square feet of office space. And then you have WMI where uh, my facility is located, which is really hardcore maritime. And so it's an effort to try and uh, balance both of those broad sectors and, and create flexibility for everything. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, to ensure a vibrant future for Annapolis, again, it's not a cure-all, but it's a step in the right direction. The land intensive uses, the working yards and services must be protected. And uh, that's the idea that triggers having so much to do with any of this flexibility. And so it discourages new office buildings in place of working yards. Um, we, Eileen can expand on this, but the, the flexibility that we're talking about or the non-maritime zoning that we're talking about is 
calculated solely on the existing structures. So it discourages new office buildings from going in and being able to be non-maritime office structures. Uh, it discourages residential and hotel uses. Um, again, that is a direct reflection of the consensus that we reached uh, with the various stakeholders from the community to the, the other experts. Um, the, the triggers, the fuel docks, the service industry, the travel lifts, the, the support people, it must contribute to and support the large working yards and maritime service industry. Um, Eileen talked about fuel docks as a new trigger, but again, the, the service industry, uh, what we view as the service industry now is what allows Annapolis to become this hub of, of refits and service and cruising and, and docking. And we are no way uh, compromising any part of that with this legislation. Um, we want to give flexibility for WMM. That's where the real problem is. That's where we started from. That's where Ross's initial uh, inquiries came from. The fact that the uh, Napa City Marina has uh, a massive hole with the EPA leaving. And there's a 30,000 square foot hole that he's been marketing for over a year for maritime tenants and um, still has not found any. And um, we're, we're all concerned about that because an empty uh, office building like the Annapolis City Marina, whether it's Annapolis City Marina or Cardi Templeton or Clarence Blackwell, all of them, they, they, we all know from running businesses that it's important to have full rents and everything else. And by uh, holding them to that uh, maritime zoning, uh, we're really uh, putting, putting uh, a lot of pressure on, on the WMM folks. So in reaching out to everybody from the community to the other stakeholders, um, there was a feeling that the, the most we would like to see is an increase of 15% to the existing uh, flexibility. And as you all know, WMM already has 30% flexibility in non-maritime use. And we were willing to take that up to 45. Um, there is another 5%, and I'll talk about that in, in a little bit, that's available to take it to a maximum of 50% um, in the WMM. But we felt that the 15% was a step in the right direction. It may be uh, not enough, it may be too much, but the annual review will let us know how those folks in the WMM are doing and the WME and the WMI and make sure that we're moving in the right direction. Um, along with that came this idea of contributing uses to the industry, the WMI and the WME, what would help those guys? And this idea of restaurants uh, came about because the, what's currently allowed in the WMI is only a class three deli with, with less than 10 seats available to serve our patrons, whether it be uh, the slip customers or the uh, the employees of the marina, and if we just talk about myself for a second, you know, we strive every day to make a better experience for our customers and encourage uh, out of town folks to come and spend the weekend with us, spend a week, uh, and they are more and more demanding uh, resort type uh, facilities from Wi Fi to restaurants to beverages to service. And it's that whole experience that we're trying to offer. And one of the things is the disparity between Annapolis and even Anne Arundel County, where restaurants is an allowed use uh, for maritime zone property. And um, the idea of the restaurants uh, as a contributing factor to the viability of the working boatyards where we have tons of room to support a restaurant, should we so desire, um, was thought to be very, very positive. So we got together with restaurant tours and the community and the other stakeholders. And uh, what came out of that, the consensus that came out of that was there was room for the restaurant 
concept in the WMI where there were large tracts of land, uh, the community pushback for WME was substantial. And as you're well aware, WME also includes uh, South Annapolis Yachting Center. And there is still a lot of angst about the idea of a restaurant at South Annapolis. And that combined with the density of Eastport and the pushback that the community gave us, uh, the consensus that the task force came up with was we were not going to change the, the restaurant operations in WME. We're going to leave them where it is, which is a maximum of 2,000 square foot restaurant as a special exception. And so uh, that's how we came to this idea of uh, contributing uses um, as restaurants in the WMI, as long as the facility had the appropriate triggers and all the standards would apply to that restaurant as it does in the, in the WMM and other maritime districts that have restaurants already. Next slide. <clears throat> so um, one of the things we want to do also is um, continue to grow our future for maritime industry. And the Annapolis Maritime Industry Fund is one of the things that was a big deal, uh, especially for uh, folks like Patrick Shaughnessy of Far Yacht Design. It was like, listen, guys, we have to aggressively market Annapolis as a maritime zone, as a maritime center. And out of that came this idea of creating a fund. And Stephen is going to uh, be able to talk more about it, but it it is designed to promote Annapolis as a mid-Atlantic center. It's going to help us recruit, relocate, and retain essential maritime businesses and industries. Um, it'll create a diverse workforce training operations, which the MTAM is really works hard on and is really gaining traction on that, but is always looking for funding to keep it, you know, uh, viable. <laughs> And uh, it'll aggressively explore blue technology opportunities. The tech that is coming to the maritime industry and, and boats and stuff is incredible, and we need to stay up with that. So the ordinance 025-21, uh, we, we, we would like to streamline the permit process for maritime zones in the winter months. I, I, I'm, I'm a, I, I'll let Eileen tie back into that, but... Um, we're also trying to tie in this idea of additional flexibility as a source of revenue for this industry fund. But Stephen will have more information on that. Um, Rod, do you want to stay with your slides and then we can at the end bring um, Stephen in uh, to answer all the questions on the fund? Yeah. Yeah. I think there are two, uh, skip one. Um, yeah. One more. Jack and and um, Julian, I just called Julian by his last name. Julian and um, Rod's next slide is two slides up after this one. Thank you. I'm so, back one. Yeah. So um, uh, again, I, I, I think that I'm preaching to the choir here with this maritime advisory group because many of you are deeply entrenched in, in the maritime industry and, and understand these uh, challenges and stuff that we see going on. So the maritime properties, again, in Annapolis, we, they must remain viable. And the challenges that are ongoing and, and are getting stronger every day with OSHA and increased environmental regulations and new code requirements are really um, challenging. The property taxes, uh, I pay the same property tax as um, you know, high density apartment buildings and office buildings on West Street. Um, construction costs, my goodness, uh, the cost of lumber, the cost of everything is just astounding. And uh, the cost to maintain and re rebuild piers. Um, and this idea that lenders somehow look at a maritime zone property like in the WMM and kind of ask that question. So let me get this straight. You can't rent anybody but a maritime tenant. Uh, I think that equals increased uh, interest rates and, and, and risk for the banks. And so that's how that gets explained. And, um, you know, in the WMM, in the office space, in the, in the 
the class A office space that the WMM offers. I mean, it's it's challenging because what we, we've seen is a slow reduction in the demand for office space. Anybody with a cell phone and a car can operate. And we've seen that play out in this COVID world that we've been in for the last 12 months. And the idea that there is a requirement for bricks and mortar really isn't true for a lot of these soft maritime people. So uh, it's becoming harder and harder and harder to recruit those people. Um, and then also the, the cyclical nature of our industry where we need flexibility for, you know, the downtimes. And I remember Ross Arnett asked us, you know, the marine industry is doing so well. Why are we even introducing this? And it was, this is a perfect reason why we're introducing this because the marine industry, if you read the six o'clock news is doing very well, but yet we have people in the WMM that are really suffering. So um, we need to be aware of the cyclical trends. Um, uh, WMI, I need to shift this over to the side. I can't really see that. Um, WMI is best for hard maritime, you know, the hard industrial side of the industry that works on boats and has technicians that work out of a truck and need flex space and garage doors to get trucks in and out and big equipment in and out. That's what WMI is all about. And WMM is, is soft maritime. And again, they're hard to identify these soft maritimes and, and even the whole concept of, of, uh, you know, if we just take example of WMM for a second in Annapolis city Marina with the EPA, even, I mean, the EPA is about the softest maritime tenant that I can come up with. So that's how challenging it is. So, uh, WME, you know, is a mix of hard, maritime and, and soft maritime. So all districts, uh, you know, are, are looking for something. And, uh, you know, there's marinas, tour operators, yacht clubs, boating schools, nonprofits, boat brokers, the whole thing. Next slide, please. So uh, it comes down to that really one of the, the, the core of what we're recommending is this idea of flexibility to these uh, uh, maritime zoned areas on non-maritime tenants. And again, starting with the WMM, that's where it came from. And this idea of spreading it out to all the zones was in an effort of sort of equality. And I can feel Debbie staring me down right now, but it's just a step in the right direction. It's uh, we thought that the 15% was um, again, uh, as far as the community was going to allow. And as far as the stakeholders were willing to go at this stage. Uh, but with all that are the triggers, the triggers are essential to reinforce the core working part. And so uh, we need to have the triggers stay in place. And uh, you've heard Eileen talk about how we're going to add fueling stations to an existing trigger, the 30 ton boat lift, the 20,000 square foot working boat yard, the 25,000 uh, square foot on land boat storage uh, and boat clubs and seafood processing to the extent that there is any of that left. Um, so as you can see in, in item C there, the 15% flexibility that we're recommending goes to WOM that WMM that brings those guys to 45% non-maritime. The WME gets 15% where they're currently zero and the WMI gets 15%, which is they're currently at zero. And, you know, it has much less of an impact on WME and WMI than it does in WMM because we don't have the type of square footage that the WMM has. I mean, the other day talking with Clarence Blackwell, um, at Annapolis Harbor Boatyard, that facility there, he has 42,000 square feet. I was blown away when I heard that. So you can see, you know, 15% uh, really, um, you know, helps him out a little bit. And then the most important thing is the ongoing evaluation that you heard me talk about before, where annually we will report back to the planning commission and understand how this change uh, has affected the industry and make sure that it is uh, moving in the right direction. Is there another slide? Yep. 
you got another couple. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this one so, you've done, but this one has a pretty picture. Okay, good. So uh, uh, the task force recommends the uses that contribute to the success of hard maritime activities. And again, you heard me go on about uh, contributing uses uh, for the hard maritime. So the first thing is uh, uh, to level the playing field, like I talked about, the inequity between just Anne Arundel County and the city of Annapolis, not to mention the city of Annapolis versus the entire maritime world out there from Maine to Florida, that restaurants are always a uh, contributing factor in a um, uh, resort type uh, marina or successful marina. There's always a restaurant component. So all the groups that we reached out to supported the idea on a larger site, like you heard me talk about. Talking to the restaurant restaurant tours, they said it has to be a minimum of 4,000 square feet if you want it to be a successful restaurant. And it needs to be subject to all the standards, indoor and outdoor dining that is already currently in place for the restaurants that are either in the conservation district now or in the WMM. WME, as I said before, 2,000 square feet and conditional use, uh, we weren't gonna go away from that because of the pushback from the community. And we just felt that um, as a strategy, if we were to push the restaurants in WME, that it would be uh, dead on arrival. And so that's why we left that alone. Uh, complimentary uses, again, uh, we, we wanna make sure that written into the, the zoning is the accessory uses like pools, laundromats, maritime activities, temporary uses, wedding venues, that sort of flexibility that allows it to be written into the code so that uh, it's an allowed use. Next slide. Um, next slide, please. Uh, thanks so much, Rod. For the residents, this is just kind of a quick summary, but because every group will say, well, what did we get out of this? Supporting these land intensive uses is something that enables the community, particularly, um, the, when you look at uh, the Eastport, Eastport, it enables Eastport residents to have the openness, the views through to the water. And something that's very important is the protection against sea level rise. There was early on, uh, people talked about resiliency. One of the best ways you provide a resilient buffer is with water dependent uses such as maritime because a boat yard can be flooded, a high rise condominium cannot. And so that was all part of looking at uh, keeping these land intensive uses and not having uh, residential or hotel uses right four feet from the water. Um, it also keeps, again, the privatizing. And when I say privatizing, a boat yard is private but it is not by nature like a residential or a hotel use where they gate off the water front. Um, so it keeps those uses that really privatize uh, the waterfront out. Um, also, uh, the whole idea of restaurants was very strongly supported by the residents on Edgewood Road. Um, they very much, a very different perspective than Eastport, they very much want to see activity in those boat yards. Uh, they, in those uh, maritime sites in WMI, they want to go down there. They want to be able to use it. They were very, very positive. Um, and it also provides, uh, this effort provides for this ongoing monitoring, we call it measuring and monitoring, but so that we'll know, do we need to expand this? Where are we? Uh, each year, and of course, the opportunity for water incentives. And with that, um, Eric, you've got the next couple slides. We'll skip one and then get to Eric's slide. Thanks. Thanks, Eileen. Hello, everyone. Eric Wyshynski, uh, Chief of Comprehensive Planning for the city. Um, you know, as Eileen mentioned, the task force was meeting at a time when we're doing the comprehensive plan for the city. It happens every 10 years. And so we're 
we're gathering um, all of the priorities that should guide uh, land use decisions over the next 10, 20, even 30 years. And um, I have to say, you know, water access is one of those citywide issues. It's not, it's not unique or specific to the maritime zones. It's something that um, is, is probably one of those top three comprehensive plan issues, um, equity, uh, equitable waterfront access, I should say. And um, not surprisingly, uh, this was a, a strong um, interest and concern voiced from the task force. Um, and to the extent that the maritime zones can contribute to improving our water access in the city, it, it sort of came down to uh, setting up a framework where it was clear that to get the kind of investment that um, we need uh, in our existing parks and even to create new parks in some cases, we need to, um, we need to merge uh, resources from a variety of sources, not just city investment, but also private investment from property owners and, and really, you know, take stock of what we have already. Um, and, you know, so I think one of the things that, you know, it's high time that we have a, a, a much more specific water access plan for the city. And we, we had the benefit of Wendy O'Sullivan on the task force. She's the super, Chesapeake superintendent from the National Park Service, which is, um, is committing a lot of resources to the city right now. Obviously, um, not, not news to anyone on this board, I'm sure. But um, it's interesting to think about what drove the Park Service's interest in Annapolis. And a lot of it has to do with this co combination of authenticity that comes from having um, an existing uh, working industry here, as well as the water access component. Um, essentially, our, our culture derives from what we still have of our industry, and we need to protect them. That's, that was really the primary task of the, of the task force. But to the extent that we can find opportunities to merge access in the industry, we were looking for that. And so we, we need a more kind of nuanced approach to how water access happens in the city. I think that was clear from the task force that not all, um, we can't have all kinds of access in a place where we have heavy industry. And so if you go to the next slide, um, to the extent um, that we need a, a, a more um, comprehensive water access plan. I mean, this is, this is what I think it would look like. Um, taking stock of existing um, water access uh, locations and opportunities, um, strategies for improving connections to those places, um, standards for access infrastructure. What do we mean by accessibility um, and programs and partnership opportunities that can really expand uh, the, the uh, diversity of people who can access the water, who don't have the resources to do that today or um, are discouraged from accessing the waterfront. It's really a, a bigger citywide issue. Um, and this map starts to show some of the um, current projects that the city is focusing on. Um, they're all at different stages of, of development. Um, so if you go to the next slide. Um, within the task force, um, one idea that, that had strong uh, support was this idea that um, there should be some incentive to property owners who uh, can contribute um, resources to improve water access, uh, perhaps on adjacent sites and uh, street end parks that need investment. And, and so this, um, this idea that 5% uh, of additional non-maritime flexibility um, was, was the number that we came to on the task force um, uh, to incentivize that investment. Um, and, you know, perhaps it goes up in the future. We, we evaluate, um, as, as you've heard, you know, this is not uh, um, a policy that is set yet, and we need to kind of reevaluate in the future. Is, is this giving us what we are looking for? Um, but what, what is clear is that there's a certain 
hierarchy of incentives that um, people on the task force really felt uh, um, would be sort of a, a differentiator. You know, so you, you have the first tier incentives, we were calling these game changers. These are the things that, you know, could really make a, a significant difference um, in the maritime zones in terms of access um, to the waterfront and, and uh, you know, investment of minimum $125,000 in a street end park. Uh, you can imagine how far that would go on, on a, a park that um, is very, is postage, postage stamp size. Um, a community boating facility, it's, it's something that we don't have currently as a city. Um, it could be a for-profit venture that has programs for, um, for community members and really you know, brings more users to the waterfront. And then the parking availability is, is something that um, task force members really sort of saw the, the benefit in because of the way that that would um, help to activate other opportunities. And you know, there's clearly a need for parking in um, the WMM and WME areas, expanded um, zones beyond there in the Eastport area. Um, and then the second tier incentives are those things that are um, still important, um, probably easier to implement in most cases, lower cost investment, but still worth some value um, for flexibility. And, and so um, they, they sort of speak for themselves, but I, I will say that the public promenade, you know, that could range. And obviously there are um, public promenades that are more of an investment, the, the sort of wood boardwalk um, style promenade that's um, out over the water. And, and then there's a simple way of creating a trail along an existing bulkhead through proper wayfinding and, and, um, and marking, you know, environmental graphics that could be more low investment, but still make a big difference. So um, next slide, please. I think that might be the extent of the slides yeah. for water access. And next slide. Um, one thing Clarence Blackwell brought up, which was a very, very good point. There has been some hammering of the industry that and the property owners that um, the industry should provide water access. And Clarence has brought up that there is a lot that sites like his and other sites, Cardi's numerous sites, do provide and we need to make uh, make it clearer what is being provided, whether it's uh, gardening for the community or uh, a waterside cafe um, that the industry has done and the property owners have done a lot and we need to make that a little bit clearer. So the priority actions, um, obviously, uh, the, one of the main uh, recommendations is the 15% flexibility, um, the support for restaurants in WMI, the uh, funding of which in just one second, Stephen will touch base on the maritime uh, industry fund, um, the commitment to monitoring, the commitment to incentives for water access. Next slide. Those are the big ticket items. So when we ask you, we would hope that you can embrace this strategic approach. It's a first step. Um, adopt <clears throat> the action plan uh, that you should all have before you. Understanding that there are three ways it will be implemented. One is with the ordinance that council produced, 02521. One is with a forthcoming water access plan. But then Stephen, do you wanna take just a minute and mention what you are doing now in terms of the Annapolis Maritime Industry Fund and programs? Uh, sure. Um, so the uh, Annapolis Maritime Industry Fund, the vision for that uh, would be that a third of the uh, fund balance would go to recruitment of maritime businesses. A third would go for the retention of existing maritime businesses. And one third would go for the expansion of maritime businesses within the maritime districts. Um, just from a process standpoint, the vision is that applications for 
uh, I'll say grants from the fund would come to economic development. We would uh, analyze those applications and then make recommendations to either the Maritime Advisory Board or a Maritime Council uh, who would ultimately make the decisions on where the money you know, would go and you know, who would get the money and what amounts. And then the money would be dispersed by the uh, Annapolis Department of, of Finance. Um, on the recruitment front, uh, the vision is you know, money for relocation assistance, if you have a business that, let's just say, is in Newport that would like to um, move to Annapolis, uh, this is money that could help in that process. Uh, and also for marketing campaigns. We talked about raising the profile of the city, making sure that uh, people up and down the eastern seaboard know that Annapolis is a, a one-stop shop on the eastern seaboard for uh, boaters and yachtsmen. And you know we have the full uh, plethora of services and a wonderful maritime ecosystem. On the retention front, um, what happens sometimes in, in economic development is that, let's just say we have a business in Annapolis uh, that is being recruited to move to another location. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sometimes there will be uh, financial incentives and uh, sweeteners and money thrown at that business to encourage them uh, to actually move. And so the vision for the fund is that if a business came to uh, the city and economic development and said, hey, I'm being uh, recruited to move somewhere else, we would have the ability with the fund to provide a matching grant. So if they're getting, you know, X amount to move, we can say, hey, well, you know, maybe we can provide you with X amount to stay uh, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and then on the expansion front, the vision is uh, if we have an Annapolis business that would like to move and grow into uh, a larger space within the districts, one of the maritime zones, um, and you know would like to invest or reinvest in the city, this would be an opportunity to provide funds to support that effort. Uh, the source of the funds, you know, we're two different things we've been looking at. One is the increased uh, assessment uh, from the, I think it's the, uh, I guess it would be 2022. Well, whenever the, the next cycle is for properties to be assessed, the in increased assessed value of properties within the maritime districts, that differential, so to speak, would actually go to support the fund. And then the other thing that we've been looking at is actually that increased 15% of non-maritime um, uh, uh, non-maritime businesses that would be allowed in each of the maritime zones, uh, finding a mechanism to uh, get those businesses to actually contribute to the fund as well. So sources, you know, I've talked about a little bit, uh, you know, uses I've talked about a little bit and process uh, and vision as well. Thanks, Stephen. Last slide is our request to you that we've got an opportunity for what we think is a great foundation. Let's go to the next slide. And we would ask you to endorse the report. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Eileen. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Rod. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, um, you're, you're correct that a number of these ideas or um, concerns we have bandied about on the Maritime Advisory Board for uh, probably 30 of the last 34 years, uh, because from the outset, there were certain inequities and things that came up that obviously should have been looked at a long time ago. Uh, what I'd like to do is probably just go alphabetically and see if there are questions or comments from members of the board. Uh, and I will take one exception to that is I will go last, even though alphabetically I'm not last. Uh, so Scott, we'll start with Scott Allen, who's on here somewhere there we down in my corner. Scott, do you have any questions or comments uh, as to 
the presentation or any suggestions regarding the uh, report or uh... I think I think it's a good report um, and as much as I've over the years have been protective of the maritime industry and not intruding too much with the uh, non-maritime I think in, in these times and economic... Scott you may be a little far from your microphone you, you were very faint Can you hear me now? No, it was even worse. Any better? Uh, not yet. Hey, why don't you come back to me? I'll see if I can fix now it. Now we can hear you. Is that better? Yes. A little bit, yeah. Who, who knows? Anyway, uh, as much as I've, over the years, been very protective of the maritime aspect of it for Annapolis, I, I think the report is great. The study's great. And uh, I'm... Um, okay with adding the extra 15%. I just don't think it ought to go too far. So we end up having a Fort Lauderdale or now in uh, Newport, Rhode Island has, has got overburdened with condominiums and all sorts of things. I was just there last week and uh, it's a mess. So um, I, th I think you're all on the right track and, and I'm okay with that extra 15%. Uh, thank you, Scott. Debbie, I think I, my alphabet, if my alphabet is correct, you would be the next. Do you have any questions or comments? Debbie may have dropped. Oh, no, she's up there. Debbie, you with us? All right, well, I'll here, make it. There you go. I'm here. Okay. Um, I was reading the ordinance and uh, the amendments, and I have two questions. First, I want to say a tremendous presentation. You all did a great job and um, it's been a lot of work to get to this point. And thank you for all that you're doing because 34 years has been too long for the review and we really appreciate that you've brought it to this point. Um, two questions. The fund that is going to be collected or that's envisioned to help market maritime businesses, who will administer that and do you have any idea in round numbers what that amount would be that you're looking for annually? That's question one. And the second question is, I understand that we are discouraging through the um, ordinance residential use in the maritime zones. And I was trying to understand specifically what the ordinance is saying about units that were residential before August 24th, 1987. Those are my two questions. Great, Debbie, I think I can answer um, both of them. I will volunteer Stephen that we, uh, we expect uh, Stephen with finance to be administering the fund. And one, uh, we are also going, you know, the part you heard several times, um, Wendy make statements that, oh, she, the park service conceivably could contribute to this fund. Well, we're going, uh, to go and see if we can't get some contributions um, to this fund because something like 100,000 to kick it off would make a huge, huge difference. Um, there will, to if there is to be some kind of a fee tied to the 15%, we're going to have, and we will let Stephen be the one who will negotiate this. We will have to have the property owners and then some people from the industry figure out a fee that we would, the word I have used, and I hope this is a fair word, is de minimis, that you don't want to say, oh, we're going to give you 15% non-maritime, and then we're going to, you know, charge you outrageous numbers, but that will be, have to be negotiated, and we've committed to having both the owners and some people from the industry and uh, Stephen in finance, and you know, noticeably whose name is left off that list, that would be mine, um, negotiate, uh, negotiate uh, what, what a, a, re a modest fund uh, would be. So um, that's the answer on that. Um, your second question was, now that I've gone off on that tangent, what was your second question? Residential. Presidential, pre-1987. So, so what, I have said this before, I'll, to a lot of people, I'll try and be 
careful in what I say publicly, but the intent of 1987, because I was there when it was written, Ben Sorrells had in WME, he had some residential uses and he had, I believe it was a daughter, but he had children and he wanted them to stay on the property and he wanted them to be able to expand the, like the single family residential structure uh, if they needed to. So that language was put in there not to relocate, not to get credit for tear down and relocate structures, um, residential, because residential is, it is legal, but it is uh, not a compatible use in the maritime districts, but to allow, um, to allow Ben Sarles or anybody else to keep a structure exactly on its footprint and allow that structure to expand after um, what happened with SAYC, we added some language in Debbie to try and make it painfully clear that you don't get credit for a structure, rip it down and move, relocate it. You can only expand it in its footprint. Thank you. That's the Ben Sorrells language. Which, which was then ad amended with the Al Graf amendment that says the R2NC criteria for compatibility also applies to residences in the in the maritime zone. So it's sort of the R2NC stuck its nose under the can under the tent uh, in that same regard. Um, Duncan, you're next alphabetically, I believe. Absolutely. First of all, I want to commend all of you on the task force for producing a very nice report and it's long overdue and very welcome. Could one of you explain a little more fully the discretionary 5% use that's written in there? So that is, um, and if um, Julian, if you can go to Stevens, not Stevens, Eric's last slide with the incentives. Um, so right now, the triggers control whether or not you get an additional 15%. But separate from that is the water access. And water access is not tied to trigger a trigger. Anybody can provide a water access um, incentive. <clears throat> and the, the discussion, and it was very robust, and I doubt that it's over, was whether 5% was enough water access incentive. So if you wanted to, you could get a 5% for these things that Eric described. Um, you like that pirate boat there in the middle? Very. Uh, yeah, <laughs> what Eric described for contributing, you know, to a boating facility or a street end park or parking. But you also, the second list, most of these items are around one to 2%. You could work your way up to 5% with the combination of an easy one would be water taxi. I think that's, I don't remember the percentages, but I think that's a percent. Um, a slip for tour operators is a percent. Um, paddle boarding, boating is a percent. So you could provide any combination of these second tier and get a 5% um, non-maritime flexibility. The discussion has been, and again, this whole re, um, strategy is about the industry. We, we are delighted to bring to the forefront water access so that there will be a water access plan. But what has happened, we have heard from some stakeholders who have said they wanna see this flip the other way around. In other words, rather than people getting 15% for providing a large working boat yard as a trigger, you would get more uh, percentage for water access and less 
for the working maritime, but but the clear intent of the task force is that the the focus is on the incentives for maritime secondarily for water access. Thank you, Eileen. That's very clear. Appreciate it. Anything else, Duncan? I'm good with it. I like it. Uh, let's see if, if, if my my uh, alphabet is correct. Mike Tomasini. I don't have any questions. Um, if those have questions for me, then it'd be, uh, I'd welcome them. I was in uh, several of those meetings and uh, and agree with a lot with the, the report in its entirety. Uh, Peter Trogdon. Hey, thanks, Terry. I think that uh, this shows some great work by the task force. So I'm, I'm excited for these changes. Um, I like the triggers, um, but I but I also feel that we need to uh, need to go a little bit further and provide some relief to uh, all the maritime zones and provide some benefit. And I'm hoping that maybe that'll happen in the future. We're a long ways from 1987, and it's been a long time since anybody looked at that. But there's there's uh, there's a real struggle out there. You know, many maritime tenants have gone elsewhere away from maritime property. Um, we see that we have seen more of that, I believe, um, that that uh, these tenants that 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 should stay in the maritime can go anywhere. Um, but there's no uh, no relief uh, for the for the maritime property holders. Um, so um, finding some more flexibility across the zones would be my hope in the future. So my question is, um, there's talk about revisiting this annually. Uh, who will do that? How will that happen? So, um, Peter, what you said was it was one, it was the major issue that was not resolved in that the, the owners clearly uh, all across the board agreed with your perspective. Um, the, the way it's set up, there's fairly clear language, we believe, between the ordinance and the amendments that the every year property owners will submit um, a list of, you know, I have 4,000 square feet of maritime tenants um, to the planning department. It will go before the planning commission. And we added that to, to give it more public emphasis. And we have mandated as it, in the zone uh, in the ordinance, it's mandated that it will be, it has to be completely reviewed in five years, but it can certainly be brought up and reviewed at any one of those annual planning commission reviews where they'll say, okay, we've done these things. Stephen, how many more business did, did we get? Uh, what do the numbers look like? How many vacancies do we have? So it is mandated to be uh, re-evaluated re uh, comprehensively in five years, but it can be, that can take place at any of these annual reviews. Okay, thank you. Um, anything else, Peter? No, thank you. All right, uh, Frida. Ter Terry, can I just chime in real quick? Sure. Eileen, is it all right with you? I, I think the real struggle with the, with the task force and, and, and part of the, the meat of where we came to was we, we did agree with the industry and the residents and the property owners all agreed that the triggers were, were integral part of maintaining maritime in Annapolis into the future. And, and we understood that there were properties like yours, Peter, and, and, and property like Scott Allen's former property that just weren't going to qualify for those triggers. And, and we were trying to find ways for, you know, if, if the struggle continued, if, uh, you know, a, a couple of years down the road, it, it had helped some of these other properties, but it didn't help the, the smaller properties in WME or the landlocked properties in, in WMM, how, how were we going to fix it? And, and I think what we came to was, let's make this not another 30 years before we look back at it, number one. And number two, um, let's try and figure out some kind of incentive program where they can get flexibility for providing something back 
that would help the industry and the and the community and 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 I and I think those things are are strong. They might not be 100%. We might need to look back at them a year from now or two years from now, but I think that they're close. I, I really do. And, I, and it came out of a lot of discussions and a lot of different meetings with residents and industry people and, and the property owners. And I, and I think we're, we're there. I think, I think we're close to what is going to get everybody long-term viability. Any, uh, other questions, Peter? No. Uh, yeah, Mike, thanks for, thanks for, um, the groundwork there and all your good work and I appreciate your comment. Uh, Bill Woodward. Oh, yes. Uh, I thought the uh, uh, work was very well done. The presentation and the division of the presenters uh, uh, went across very well, in my opinion. Thank you. Uh, I do have one comment. Um, in the, I think it was a WMM and a WMI, uh, the color scheme seemed to be a little confusing to me. There was a kind of like a royal blue and a, and a purple, and they seemed very close. And it would it was a little challenging to differentiate the two in in the um, on the hard copy. Um, I might have the, the two, right? but there was there are two different blues, or one might be ravens and one might be I don't know. Uh, Indianapolis Colts blue or something. I don't know. <laughs> need to be a little different. That's all. And you know, that map, you okay. are absolutely right. That map has never been good. And oh. all the presentations, it's been like, oh, we got to change it. Okay. Well, anyway, I'm glad I pointed that out and got a few smiles to make it a little lighthearted. But uh, obviously, a lot of work has been done and um, it shows very well. And I, I, I compliment all of you. Uh, who have done the work on it. Thank you. All right. Um, I, I echo yeah. what everyone has said in terms of the, the quality of the presentation. <laughs> and the, Frida. Oh, 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 Frida, Frida, Frida. Sorry. Sorry, <laughs> Frida. Thank you, Terry and everyone. I really appreciate all the work that the months and months of effort that's gone into this report. And I look forward to eating at the restaurant at Rod's yard at some point. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do have a couple of um, questions and comments. Thank you for holding the line on the um, WME restaurant standards. It's really important to my friends that live over by SAYC. And I think that's going to be you know, really important as time goes by. Um, I, I'd like to ensure that the buffers and planting standards are protected. Um, you know, we, we restaurants have been here longer than any, I mean, residents have been here longer than any new incoming restaurants. And, you know, we're already having major issues with that in Eastport. Um, I'd also appreciate it if the current parking requirements or, uh, or Increasing the parking requirements for non-maritime users could be highlighted. You know, that's that's a real issue for here. Um, and I I also am concerned. I have several friends that are on the a task force, and they feel like they have not seen all the report yet. Um, they're kind of they've seen bits and pieces but they feel like not everyone has been included and um and has seen everything so i'd, I'd like to like to uh to ask that that happen at some point and then also i'm i'm on the esports civic association board of directors and months ago we submitted written questions that we asked for responses to um several important questions that are important to our residents and we're still waiting for a written response to those questions. So I, I'm not ready to endorse this report yet until we see the answers to those questions, but I think it's very close and just needs some, some more additional tweaking, but thank you. Um, so Terry, I, I can respond to several of those. Um, first of all, all of, and this is a, a comment to uh, Sally and Eric, I believe all of the buffer, and planting standards, all of that is, you know, is incorporated. Um, the parking requirements, 
right now there are one set of requirements for office use. I believe it's um, a space every, there's a higher requirement for the non-maritime same office uses in maritime districts than there are everywhere else. And the thought was that there would be, there's no reason if you have the same use to have a higher requirement in the maritime districts than everywhere else. So that, that was the issue with the parking. Um, the, let me speak to two things. I'll speak to the, re, um, the request. The uh, Eastport Civic Association requested, uh, they sent in a list of questions. I responded to those questions at an Eastport Civic full association meeting, I responded to, let's say there were eight, I responded to six to the entire Eastport Civic Association. There were then two questions and they, I, I don't have them in front of me, but they included a request for additional analysis. And Stephen, um, Stephen, did you, did you respond in an email or verbally because the planning department was not in a position to undertake another study. Um, did, how did you respond to that? Was it in an email? Uh, I believe so. I'd have to go back and check. We, but it, there was, I wanna be careful in how I am thoughtful in how I say this. The Eastport Civic Association sent out in writing, you know, the, the comment Frida just made and while it is not untruthful that the planning department did not do the report, the additional analysis, which was a, a major work effort that was requested. It certainly was not accurate that there was no response. The response was to the entire civic association. And I believe Stephen said in an email of the remaining two requests that this was not a work effort the uh, the department could take on. Well, I do believe that uh, a verbal response was not requested it, uh, to answer all of the questions. And um, so, you know, we, before ECA can endorse this also, we were, were waiting for written responses to our written questions. Thank you. So, Frida, yeah, I appreciate that. And like I said, giving a verbal response to about 50 or 60 of the Eastport Civic Association members, we believed was the best way to respond so that everyone would see it. Um, but I will have Stephen dig out his uh, response and we can resend his response. But the bottom line is the planning department did not have the capacity to take on additional analysis, which is what was requested. Um, so the other issue, uh, a couple of people uh, were a couple of people in the residential community um, were told that they did not get to uh, see items. That is not accurate in any way, shape, or form. Everyone got the report the second the report was released. It was released to the task force and to the planning commission on the same day, I believe that date was July 15th. So everybody got that report. Then what, where there was confusion is the Civic Association board or at least one person on that board seemed to think that the task force should be reviewing and analyzing the ordinance. The ordinance was not the work of the task force. The task force work was this report. The ordinance was the work of the council. They requested, uh, all but one council member requested uh, that their name be on the ordinance. We worked with the city attorney, uh, Sally Nash, Eric and I, to make sure that there was nothing in the ordinance that was not contained in the report and that it was completely compatible, but the ordinance then doesn't go back to the task force. And there were not 
separate meetings with anyone. There was not, everyone saw the same information. This week, we are meeting with all of the task force groups in their working teams to clarify this uh, misrepresentation that's gone out. So I hope that that answers your question. Eileen, let me ask you a question. The, you indicated the report, the, both the executive summary and the task force report uh, were available. I, I didn't look online because I, I got a copy from Eric, uh, as did every member of the board, but, uh, and, and probably when it came out, but um, is, is the report online also? It is. Yeah, it's on a it's on a dedicated website we have for the Maritime Task Force that um, a link to which is on our comprehensive planning, um, uh, our Annapolis Comprehensive Plan 2040 um, on the sidebar. So the easiest way to access that on the main page of the city's website, there's a link at the bottom for comprehensive plan. It's one of the five you know, buttons, larger buttons. Uh, you can click on that. They'll take you to our comprehensive plan website and on the sidebar. Uh, so the so, Maritime so this is a, a subset of the comprehensive plan document. Yes, it is. That's okay. right. Okay, thank you for that. And I'll make sure that uh, my friends that are on the task force are aware of that. And the ones that I'm referring to are not ECA board members. So thank you. Okay. Um, Barry, if I could, just before I leave that topic, I, Eileen touched on it, but I want to make sure everybody on the Maritime Advisory Board does understand that's where this whole confusion is coming from, is the difference between the task force strategy and the ordinance as it was written, because that's very different and includes a lot more things than what the task force recommended. And as Eileen articulated, that, that never came back to the task force. So when people read the ordinance, they assumed it was the task force writing that and it wasn't the task force writing that. And so we've doing our best to inform all of our task force members the difference, because it's a gray line there. It's a little bit fuzzy. And even some of us that have been down in the weeds uh, entrenched in this thing were, were taken aback a little bit until we kind of fully understood the process, if that makes sense. And that was what I what I uh, was hope, hoping to convey when I pointed out at the outset that we are here on the strategy report and not on the ordinance. And the ordinance, which is only addresses the zoning aspect, it will come back to us in the form, normal course of our review of, of uh, legislation affecting the maritime industry. And then we have an opportunity to look at the ordinance, which comes from the is referred by council. It's been referred by city council to this separate and apart from the task force report. But Eileen, let me, uh, uh, Frida, anything else? I, uh, I wanna thank Frida for bringing those issues up because Frida, they've been out there and we've been trying to respond, but I really appreciate you bringing them up because like I said, what would transpire normally, let's say if this, if we had two years to do this, the task force would finish, the report would come out as it did. Then we would go through a process like we are with you all tonight to get uh, adoption of the report. Then after all of that, typically the ordinance would come out because there was such a desire to have the ordinance um, come out you know, while the council, this council wanted it, the ordinance came out at basically the same time as the full task force report. And that's where, you know, people were like, well, we didn't see that because it was a, a it's a council, uh, including the mayor, members of the council ordinance. So it's, the process was not as smooth or not as uh, linear as would have been helpful. But thank you very much for bringing it up so we could address it. And thank you, Eileen and so, Rob and Eric. Thank you. So uh, I, I, again, I started out by, by uh, and I endorse what uh, the other members have said about appreciating 
the work that's gone into this. Uh, I was on one of the teams on the task force. Uh, I know the number of hours that were put in by Eileen and Rod and Mike and others to come to this. And frankly, I think the report is a is a is a is a is a, is a e excellent work. I do have some questions, and I do have a and then I'm going to have a question about uh, about the report before I ask for a motion. Um, so the current size of restaurants in WME remain at 2,000 square feet? Yes. And in WMI, the proposal is for 4,000 square feet. Can, can somebody give me a idea of what, what is a 4,000 is, is a 4,000 square foot restaurant? Is it a chart house? Is it a boat yard? Is it boat a- Boat yard is 4,000 square feet. Okay, so we're talking- Chart house now. is 94 or 9,600 square feet. Okay. Um, and I think, and I, I hope I remember this correctly, but each level at the yacht club is, is each, I think it's around 6,000 square feet per yeah, level. Yeah, right. to, if yeah, you can right. think about a, you know, a floor at the Yacht Club, that's <laughs> around six. But the boat yard, the original boat yard was a little was 2,800. And then the addition is another 1,200. So the boat yard's a good example of 4,000. And so just so I, so I can wrap my head around it. So the original the original boat yard, not the little annex, is slightly larger than what would be otherwise be permitted in WME? Yes. Okay. Um, 800 square feet. Okay. Um, Stephen, you talked about, uh, we talked about, um, and you, I think you were the right person, uh, or maybe Eric. One of the things that this board has talked about in the past, and uh, it, I, it came to mind when Rob Rod was talking about the property taxes. Um, you know, the 11 percent increase in property tax since 2000 is a major contributing factor to, um, among some of the other expenses, as to how why rents in the maritime district uh, start to get prohibitive for a maritime tenant. And I would ask that in part of the uh, the going forward in either the Part of the comprehensive plan or uh, as part of the developing the economic side, uh, the economic incentive side of, uh, of this plan is that we visit the issue of whether or not there can be property tax release either by assessment or by rate uh, because the, as I think it was Rod that pointed out, you know, his marina is getting taxed as though we had a, a Marriott waterfront hotel on it because that's the highest and best use. And yet the maritime zones essentially are a restrictive zoning, which affects the, uh, the ability to have a waterfront Marriott hotel, which we don't want, but uh, and nothing against Marriott, we just don't want a hotel on the property. Um, so if we could put that on a, uh, an item to be looked at, I think that would be helpful. Um, my last comment before I ask Eileen uh, something more, technical aspect of the report. Uh, to Scott's question about, uh, or maybe it was Peter's, about um, what are we doing for the properties, the maritime properties that do not have the ability to have any trigger. Um, I, I throw this out to Sally and to Eric as part of the comprehensive plan. I understand, my recollection is, is that changes to the use tables, which we are talking about here, can be done the way we're doing it. But a change to the zoning must come about as part of the compre a comprehensive plan. Uh, am I correct with that, Sally? Yeah, you're, you're right. If we, we can make text amendments um, through our, this process that we're following with city council, but if we wanna change the actual map itself, you have to either do a comprehensive review through the comp plan a sector study, or um, you have to show that there's been a change in the character of the neighborhood or a mistake in fact uh, for the original zoning for um, one particular parcel. So it's definitely the best way to do it is the, the comprehensive plan or the sector study approach. So, um, 
and I, I mentioned this, um, I can't remember who I mentioned it to, but it occurred to me that maybe a solution to the uh, issue of the properties in the maritime zones that do not have the um, ability to have a trigger and therefore avail themselves of uh, a non-maritime office component would be to create uh, as under the comprehensive plan, a subset of zoning of those WM, WME, and particularly WME and WMM zones that include those properties that do not have the ability to have a trigger and then use that zoning subset to provide for the equivalent non-maritime use that the ones that have triggers have. I just throw out that idea since we do have a comprehensive plan coming up as to whether that might be a way to um, accommodate this conundrum we have that Mike Tomasini alluded to or actually spoke to about the, um, the properties that do not have the ability to have a trigger. And I just throw that out uh, for food for thought. Um, Eileen, um, we are being asked to, or I'm a, we're going to ask to have the uh, task force report um, um, uh, adopted or uh, embraced, or what was the term you used? Uh, endorsed uh, or adopted, either way. Endorsed, endorsed is the matter. You can I, embrace I it as well. It, is it appropriate, because I have three small but somewhat specific uh, rec thoughts about that to amend the report. We are not looking for amendments. You can certainly, we're trying to re in, um, take the report forward as is, unless there's a mistake or a typo or something like that. So the three things that come that came across to me, um, one is, uh, and I'll, I'll give a page reference, page 47, but it also frankly carries over into your slide presentation is the only table that proposed uh, totals are 45%, 15% and 15%. And yet on the slide, there is a slide that also talks about 50%. And I think it would be helpful to dispel confusion that that table on page 47 were expanded to include the other 5% uh, uh, under the heading of incentives as opposed to triggers. And that would help. Uh, That's a clarification. That'd be easy enough to do. Okay. The second thing that caught my eye was um, that we, the, and I, I went back and I was rereading the water access session. I'm aware, um, frankly, that water access is a, uh, a hot topic um, as Eric, I think, pointed out. Um, and it would, it seemed to me that it would be helpful that there be actually a specific timeline for uh, at least commencement of the water access plan. You mentioned November, but there's no time. I, I don't report. think that is something that should be in the document. We are going to, um, we're going to, because that's not something that came out of the task force, uh, Sally can, and we will, we're recommending that it commence in November and we will do that when we speak to council um, to, to clarify uh, that there is a specific commencement date, but that, that wasn't something that came out of the task force. The, uh, the third thing um, is that there is, uh, there was discussion and I believe that the staff amendment to one of the staff amendments to the proposed ordinance may address it that uh, that provides uh, an enforcement component as opposed to simply a monitor and report. Um, but I do note that the report um, talks on page 49 only talks about measuring success and does not address, I did not see the word enforcement or in, in there. And I just think that's a, that I, Knowing the some of the background on um, uh, in arguments about enforcement or lack of enforcement, somewhere that ought to probably be highlighted sooner rather than later, um, either in uh, a, a sentence in the report or at least in the uh, the presentation 
uh, going forward, because I think that I have heard that has been a, a hot topic that you can report all you want, but if the report says I'm out of compliance, but there's no enforcement mechanism, um, then we get, uh, then we're back to square one in terms of sort I, of- I don't have the report in front of me, uh, Terry. I can look at that language because we've in everything we've done in the presentations, we, we use the words, um, even in the presentation, this evening, you know, we use the words enforcement and there's very strong enforcement language in the ordinance. Um, right. Well, and I'm looking at, I'm just looking at it because I read the section under measuring success, which is, which talks about the, uh, the you know, reporting and, uh, and evaluation, et cetera. But you might just take a look at that because I don't think that word appears. Um, it's certainly not in a, in a strong sense that we know uh, that the legislation intends to do. I can have the person who edited it do a, a word it's check. No word search. The I, word I, search I to, do to that. see if it appears and um, to make sure that it's in that document somewhere. Okay. Um, all right. With that, um, and uh, I will, uh, I would take a motion for this board to uh, endorse the Maritime Task Force report and strategy as presented. At this point, Mr. Hood has made a mo has moved. Mr. Allen has seconded Tammy, so Duncan Hood has moved uh, adoption uh, endorsement, and Mr. Allen has seconded it. Um, I will call for discussion. Although we've had it, we went round had a long all the way around on the discussion. Is there any further discussion? All right. Uh, all in favor of. Uh, endorsing the Maritime uh, Industry Task Force Report and the strategy that is set forth therein, say aye. 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 All opposed? I'm going to abstain at this point, and I'd like to see a few more tweaks, as I mentioned. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Frida. All right. Um, with that, Eileen, is there anything else uh, that you need to uh, uh, do? So no, thank you very much. You guys have been terrific with really good questions. A uh, couple of things we can follow up with from Frida and we'll make the uh, two of the three comments you've referenced, Terry, we'll get them into the report. Hey, thank you. Thanks, Eileen. Great job, Rod. Bye. Thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure. All right. Um, I think we'll, we'll shoot to... Uh, wrap up here fairly quickly. While we have the benefit of uh, Tammy, um, let me see if there's, let me have a motion for, uh, first of all, is there any uh, changes to the June minutes? All right, is there a motion to approve the minutes from June? So moved. Uh, I second. Steady moved, who seconded? Mr. Oh. Duncan seconded. He, his mouth was moving, but his- Oh, his, no, I did, Bill. Oh, Bill, Bill seconded. I, yeah. Ah, good. Thank you. Mr. Woodward is seconded. All in favor of approval of the minutes? Aye. 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 Don, uh, I'll skip the county MIAB update. Um, Stephen has already exited. No, you haven't. Um, is there any more that you want to say tonight, Stephen, or have you said enough for the night? I probably have said enough. I'll just be very brief. Um, our uh, things are going pretty well. Our vacancy rate is 5.5%. We've had nine new expanding or relocating businesses um, uh, in the month of July. Um, let me see. We're focused on managing the recovery zones for the remaining couple of months before November 1st and they go away for the winter. And last month, we, uh, we meaning economic development, assisted 37 businesses. So uh, there's a lot of activity. I think things are going pretty well, all things considered. Thanks. All right, thank you, Stephen. Um, the, Duncan, I think we've sort of covered the comprehensive plan uh, and we've covered the Maritime Task Force update. I think we have. Um, Debbie, is there any change in the NDZ application that you're aware of? I'm not aware of anything since our last meeting. 
Um, and uh, Beth, any update on the Burtis House? I see Ashley's not with us tonight, so you may know, may or may not know anything. I don't know any updates on that. All right. See, we're just rocking and rolling. Um, how about uh, I did? There was an article in the paper about uh, the city's working on something to do with Wells Cove in terms of getting some uh, access down to the water, but no uh, dip your toes in the water. I think the issue, and I've actually been up into Wells Cove, so I can appreciate it a little bit. Um, there is a huge uh, stormwater outfall that uh, is directly located on the um, area that is contemplated for an easement that makes it somewhat prohibitive to be able to uh, uh, you know, get into the water from that easement area. Uh, but I think the, what I've read, certainly read in the paper, the, um, uh, the city seems to be moving towards uh, an easement or some form of license or access uh, to be able to walk down to uh, the end of the water there on Wells Cove. Uh, Beth, I don't know if you have any more uh, information on that Wells Cove or any of the other street ends. I mean, what, what I seem to um, glean from what I have heard from attorneys and from the newspaper is that we're having a big fight over nothing. <laughs> it doesn't appear to me that anyone's going to gain anything other than a walk down to the water, which will, uh, I think, be bordered by a fence. So it's going to be like an impoundment. Uh, and it, like you said, Terry, that outfall makes that area impossible because it silts in as fast as you could possibly dredge it. So I understand the desire to have waterfront access. I'm not sure how this is going to come out in a positive way. Well, I guess, I, and I guess we, we bandy about the term waterfront access. And as um, Eileen, I think, mentioned, there are areas, and, and including over by uh, uh, Chart House, where there are park benches and amenities where you can, you know, take, take a sandwich and a soda or a beer. Actually, you can't drink it in public. Just take a sandwich and a soda and go sit on the, uh, sit down by the water and you know, that's water, that's water access. It isn't dipping your toes in the water, but certainly it, it, it gets you down next to the water in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a waterfront setting. So um, certainly if there's a, some type of a pedestrian access down to that area, um, that's, uh, you know, that's as, that's, a, that's as that much access as you get at some of the street end parks at this point. All right. Um, Last but not least, on the new business, and I've already pretty much touched on it, is the um, 02521, the, z the zoning. I understand there are staff amendments uh, that clean up some of the uh, language and er errors and omissions, I'll call it, in the current uh, zoning. Uh, they have not been introduced to council yet. I don't think they've been circulated yet. Uh, one of the reasons for um, are my wish to defer the consideration of the, um, the ordinance itself until after the planning commission and the, perhaps the rules committee have had their input so that we have the benefit of any proposed amendments, uh, recommendations from those two bodies. And we, have, uh, we will have the, uh, at least as comprehensive a set of ordinance as uh, uh, we'll have before the council starts really taking it up in public testimony and things like that. So uh, the plan will be to have those, that, in, that ordinance will be the primary piece of business in the September meeting. I don't know when council, the council meetings are. Uh, it might be that we will have to um, ha advance our meeting or a few days if, in order to accommodate um, a council schedule perhaps, but we will, um, I'll find that out and I'll let everybody know. It'll be a Zoom meeting. Uh, so um, you can be out of town, Duncan can be on his boat. What's, and Frida has a question. Yes, um, will there be um, any of the sponsors of the legislation giving a presentation to us that night on the, on the uh, zoning amendments? I would hope that somebody, uh, would besides me, um, when you when you read the uh, 
the zoning, uh, the ordinance, uh, and there are some some uh, protocols in in the drafting. One of which is, if it is strict, if le- if the letters are if the words are stricken through, it's deletion. If they're all in capitals, it's new language. And if it's just the normal upper lower case, it is existing language. So you, it's important to kind of realize what's already there and not take the ordinance as being all a new change. Uh, there's a lot that's already there. Uh, obviously things are being changed, but just read it with that, those protocols in mind and it'll make uh, sense as to what's, what's new, what's old and what's uh, um, gonna be stricken. So, and most of the striking is because there's new language to replace the old uh, as it's being updated. Hey, Mike? Yeah, just, I, I wanna circle back. I didn't get my hand up in time on the Wells Cove thing. I think that um, it's it's incumbent on this board to try and help the city find the best solution for that problem and not the current solution. And I think that, and I think, and I think that um, the, there are there is a way to provide equitable access there. It it, it is going to require a little bit of work, um, and it is going to require a, a lot of cooperation from private properties that abut that uh, easement. But I think that there's a real gem there that we shouldn't just let go because it's hard. So um, I think as, as the discussions continue and as the city formulates a plan, I, I think that we should really press for, for what is the best in the, in the interest of the community. So um, Mike, I've been in there by, uh, by water um, uh, and I've seen that sewer outfall. Um, are you talking about Working, working something that works over that or adjacent to that. Yeah, uh, uh, over that, not not necessarily adjacent to that, but but over that, and it is going to require some some cooperation from the property owner who's on the on the right side of that as you walk down. Um, I I did live there for for two years. Um, I I understand, but it 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 could be a water taxi spot. I, I don't know that it can be anything more than that, but I, I think there's a possibility there for a, a true water access piece if, if we're willing to try and find a solution. I will reach out to Ashley and see what um, I can learn. <laughs> That's about all I could say. Um, Scott, you sort of put your hand up. I had two questions. One, um, the actual ordinance, is it ready to be seen yet or should we wait? Oh, no, I circulated it to everybody about a month ago when, as soon as it came out. Okay, I have to look back in the emails then. So that's and if you, go, if you go online to the um, city, uh, on the website, to the uh, city council tab under legislation, if you just search 02521, uh, you'll get it. You'll get a staff report. Uh, you'll get the whole thing. The other thing is, um, I was reading an article about the Wells Cove, and it almost sounded like they had some agreement with landowners. But Mike, I, I understand what you're saying. And Terry, um, from a legal standpoint, can you can the city do eminent domain? I think that was mentioned in the article on the water part, not on somebody's property per se, but on the water rights. You know, it's Mike. I, I go by and it's kind, of, it's kind of carving up a pie there in the corner, right? And and can the city take away the, the water? I, I don't think the city can do eminent domain over the water. They can do eminent domain over their land. But the question is, and, and I suspect, Mike, and I may be mistaken, but I suspect the issue is that the, that cove is, is, a, is curved such that all of the lateral lines all crisscross over each other and everybody is claiming the same piece of water uh, as part of their property because of their lateral line extending um, because it's a, it's a cove rather than a peninsula. With a peninsula, all the lateral lines diverge. But on a cove, they all come together at a point. And in this case, the point is probably several feet off the, off the shoreline. Is there a precedent uh, for in the city? This must have happened before somewhere on how, on how it's carved up and shared. Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a property rights enforcement as opposed to a city ordinance issue at, you know, at some point. 
Um, and it is a, um, you know, the, the, the law on lateral lines is clear as the bud that comes out of that stormwater pipe um, in terms of uh, how they how they are done. And they, they I'm not aware of any of them that have addressed it when it's so tight like that go there. So. In the community arched pier. Going over yes, the it's a, properties. yes, Mike, yeah. All right. Uh, anybody else have any uh, comments before we get up? It's Duncan. Uh, just one real quick one. This I think is for Stephen. Hey, um, Stephen, I am going into planning for the Chesapeake Bay schooner race. And as I do, I'm talking to different communities about COVID and the Delta variant. Do you guys have any plans on any changes in masking or anything like that coming up what's your take on that whole thing uh i'm not aware of any ch uh changes that are uh what's the word coming down the pipe uh we take our mm, guidance and direction on the health matters from uh, dr kaliana Raman from uh, Anne Arundel uh, Health Department. And so he, you know, essentially serves as the health officer for the city as well. Um, I know that they're monitoring everything with regard to the Delta variant. There's a lot of concern. Um, from what he said today, uh, let, me not, let me not go based upon memory. He said that the uh, uh, case rates have plateaued, uh, but hospitalizations are rising. And so Delta is penetrating through the vaccine uh, more so than any of the other variants. And uh, coronavirus may become something that we have to take an annual vaccine shot for, just like the flu. So that's the uh, my takeaways from his briefing today. Thank you. I, I know that in Baltimore, they've gone back to mandating masks everywhere inside. And that's just kind of why I asked you that question. Thanks. Sure. Well, the, the courts the courts have done that also. I was in, I actually had to go back to my car because I forgot my mask this morning. Uh, at, but uh, the courts, of the government offices, I think, have all gone to that. Same thing at Navy. You have to drive through the gate with a mask on and masks are required indoors. Thanks, Frida. Good to know. All right. Is there a motion to adjourn so we can let Tammy, uh, oh, before we move to adjourn, Tammy, uh, I, I think I hopefully thanked you the first time around, but uh, thank you for coming back for uh, an Encore uh, appearance. We appreciate it. Um, Wish you were staying more, but uh, we understand uh, things move on. But thank you again for coming back tonight. We'll You're miss quite you. welcome. <laughs> I will miss you guys tremendously. And I was very, very happy to serve you guys. Thank well, you so much. Thank, we thank love you, you Tammy. <laughs> we we love, love you too. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Tammy. We do love you. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you, guys. All right. Is there a uh, motion to adjourn? I'm a, I make a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Frida. Is there a second? Second by Peter. Second, uh, second by Peter Trogdon. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous, Tammy. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for your patience tonight. Uh, thanks for the comments, the discussion. Um, it's been 34 years, and it's not over yet. Thank you. <laughs>